Uh, thank you to Hark Strike for the invitation to talk to you while you enjoy your lunch. Um, these are my disclosures. I have a formula which I've licensed to uh, several manufacturers. But the topic today is focused on one specific aspect of calculations, and that's the role of this very interesting new parameter, the posture cornea, in our calculations, and to look at theoretical modeling versus uh, direct uh, measurement. So let's jump into the essence. And the essence is this, that ever since Javal introduced his keratometer, when we measure keratometry, we're measuring the anterior surface. And we account for the posterior cornea by basically a fudge factor, which is accounted for by the so-called keratometer index. You can be more sophisticated. You can use a Gaussian model for the cornea. And you see in the Gaussian model for the cornea, suddenly the posterior cornea appears. So even if you don't measure it, you can use the Gould strand ratio to plug into your Gaussian model for corneal power. But now we have uh, new devices, uh, Scheinflug, uh, Swift Source OCT devices, which can directly measure the posterior cornea. And we can plug in the actual direct measurements in place of the assumed values for the posterior cornea. So having new devices, new biometers, um, is part of the puzzle. But most evidence suggests that so far, using direct measurements of the posterior cornea has been somewhat disappointing. And the reason, uh, I believe, is what's been missing is the best way to use this information within formulae. So my own formula, uh, the universal uh, two, is uh, paraxial ray tracing, Gaussian thick lens formula, and it's well suited to using this new parameter, which we now have, the posterior cornea. And um, the version of the Barrett Universal, which does allow you to use a posterior cornea, um, as implemented in the Zeiss Almas 700, is called the Barrett Universal TK. And of course, it's available online on the uh, online website at APA Series. <clears throat> org. So the potential for measuring the posterior cornea is threefold. Potentially for spherical power, for toric cylinder prediction, and for post-refractive cases. Let's look at each in turn. As far as spherical power, there's two elements to spherical prediction. One is the vergence calculation for lens power, the other is the ELP prediction. So the ELP prediction stays basically the same but the vergence prediction is now based potentially on this new parameter. If you look at the universal formula, it performs uh, well in comparison to traditional formulae. It even performs well in comparison to some of the newer formulae based on uh, AI. And if you look at the publication in ophthalmology uh, a little while back, you'll see that the prediction error versus axial length is very flat compared to earlier formulae. And this is the reason why you don't need to have special formulae for short, medium, and long eyes, because the new modern formulae are pretty flat across the axial range rate. And uh, this is a series of patients which I performed, uh, looking at outcomes, spherical outcomes uh, initially, looking at the universal two with standard K versus the universal two with TK, which is posterior cornea. So first let's look at standard K. And you can see here, and I'll just highlight the percentage of patients within a half diopter. So you can see with uh, modern formulae, you can get excellent prediction with standard keratometry, 95% within a half diopter. Uh, in this series. It's always good to look at the box plot because the box plot shows you the first and third quartile, it shows you the outliers, and essentially the more compact the box, the better. If you then do the same comparison, same patients, but now use um, not the standard K, but the TK, the posterior measured cornea, 
you can see it still does well, 91.4%. It's still better than the other formulae, but it's actually not better than what I showed you with the standard K. Now, this is with normal I, so that's a proviso. And once again, showing you the, the box plot. What's quite reassuring, if you look at the optimized lens factor for standard K, or the optimized lens factor for when the posture corner is measured, there's very little difference, 0.07. So it's reassuring that you can use the same constants for both versions of the formulae. Let's look at toric prediction now, toric cylinder prediction. And um, we've learned so much about toric prediction. We've learned um, not to use the mean magnitude for SIA, we use a centroid value instead. We've learned to make our axis at a consistent location, keep it small, and particularly use uh, SIA of the centroid value, different methods of alignment, def big improvements. And all these have helped the puzzle of predicting toric outcomes uh, accurately. Uh, as far as prediction formulae, perhaps one of the most important uh, events was Doug Koch's lecture in 2012, because he reminded us not to forget the posterior cornea. And there's various ways you can use the posterior cornea, regression, ray tracing. My own method is a theoretical model. It's not a regression-based method. It's not a population-derived method, but based on an explanation which I came up in my mind to explain the ph phenomenon of posterior corneal astigmatism, based essentially on the fact that the eye has a larger diameter in the horizontal meridian. But one thing which is uh, within my formula is a recognition of something which not really everybody uh, comprehends, and that is when you measure the cornea with uh, any device, you measure on the visual axis. But the optical elements of the eye are aligned on the optical axis. And this difference, angle alpha, the difference between the optical axis, makes the lens appear to be tilted. And the lens tilt adds an additional component to the unexplained against the rule of stigmatism, which we observe. And so whether you use my formula on a theoretical model or you use it on a direct measurement, an algorithm accounts for this missing piece of information, both predicted and measured posterior cornea astigmatism. If you look at the literature, this method does well. This was a paper uh, published by a group from Portugal where the toric calculator uh, performed well in comparison to uh, other methods. And so in this study, I'm looking at the same series of patients, but I'm looking at the toric prediction. And I'm comparing traditional holiday toric calculator to the Barrett toric calculator, both the theoretical model and the measured posterior cornea. So here's the uh, study, and you see, once again, 210 hours. Most of the patients were toric because 80% of my practice uh, have toric lenses uh, implanted. And we're looking at the predicted uh, error in residual astigmatism. So you see here now, um, this is using a comparison of holiday initially, no posterior cornea, only 48% within a half diopter. If you give a toric calculator just the total corneal power, it still doesn't do that great, 61%. But you need to use the baritoric calculator either with a measured posterior cornea and, or the predicted posterior cornea, and you can see both do well, 80.5% and 88%. Similar to the sphere in my hands, Measuring the posture cornea does well, but in conventional eyes, I don't see it offering uh, a distinct advantage compared to standard uh, keratometry. And the final group of patients to consider are those post-refractive. And perhaps this is one of the most challenging areas we face today in our day-to-day -day practices, dealing with patients who've had LASIK. Because of course, when you've had LASIK, um, what happens is you flatten the cornea, but you don't change the posterior cornea. So that ratio between posterior to anterior radius of curvature has been changed. And the assumption that formulae make is no longer actually true. So that requires special formulas for post-refractive patients. And one of those formulas is the true K formula. And uh, compared to other formulae on the ASCRIS website, it's shown to be uh, more accurate, uh, particularly when no history is available. 
A more recent publication, that was in 2016, this is uh, towards the end of last year, with hyperopic prediction, it does well as well. Once again, the no history is still doing well, 73.4%. And in RK, this is a paper that has been accepted for publication, we had good results using the true K for patients post-RK. Uh, particularly when a patient has had previous refractive surgery, you cannot use a standard toric calculator. You cannot use a, a modern calculator which accounts for the posterior cornea because it's changed. You need a specific toric calculator. And this is the true K toric calculator. This is a specialized version for post-refractive patients. You can see 74% within a half doctor versus holiday, uh, versus holiday with AK regression. So what about measuring the posterior cornea? So perhaps something new I'll tell you today is that when it comes to choosing the best method for post-refractive patients, I would think you should consider version two of the, of the true K formula. It's only available online. It's not available on any barometer as yet because I think this is going to prove to be something that will give us better uh, predictions. So when you press on calculate, you're given an option, predicted or measured posterior cornea. And if you um, go on and, and select the universal formula, you'll see that the default gives you just the normal predicted posterior cornea. That's what you're used to with the true K. But if you go back to the patient data, and now select measured posterior cornea, you'll be presented with a new page. You select your device, and you enter the measured posterior cornea. Please be sure that you tell the formula whether you're putting in the radius or you're putting in the power of the posterior cornea, because the values are very similar, but it has to know what you've put in. Ignore negative signs, minus signs, just put in the absolute value for the posterior corneal uh, measured posterior cornea. Then when you go back to uh, the patient data, and you press uh, calculate, and then you select uh, universal formula, you then have a prediction which is based now on the measured posterior cornea. So this is an option which has only been available maybe six to 12 months. Now, if you look at the results, and these are 60 eyes, my own, Mike Lawless, and Tun Kwan uh, from Singapore, and we're comparing now the prediction accuracy of true K with and without posterior cornea compared to the conventional or other methods for post-refractive patients. So here you see we have, with true KTK, 70% within a half diopter versus 63% with the model posterior cornea versus the other methods. And if you see graphically here, uh, both the true K with measured or predicted does well, but there is here a distinct advantage. It's statistically significant better with the measured posterior cornea rather than one based on a theoretical model. And um, I don't know what happened to the screen, but equally interesting if you um, go back to the true K toric calculator, you get the same option. You can use the measured posterior cornea for the true K toric. And then the uh, display toric lens that you um, measure will be based on the measured posterior cornea. And uh, in a smaller number of patients, only 23 eyes, comparing the true K toric calculator with standard Ks or with the posterior cornea, once again, you see that the toric prediction is better again with the true K toric measured posterior cornea than the true K toric predicted. The differences are small. Both methods are definitely better than uh, the other methods of toric prediction post-refractive surgery. And as yet, with these numbers, 23 eyes, I couldn't detect a statistical significance. But I think it will be there. So for those challenging cases, um, this will improve your prediction, the measured posterior cornea, after ref uh, refractive surgery. Uh, standard spherical prediction, I can't see a distinct benefit from using posterior cornea. Same with toric, with normal eyes. Maybe there's a subgroup of unusual eyes, keratoconus, et cetera, where it will still prove to be better. 
but we haven't identified this subgroup yet. But even at this early stage of using these parameters, what I'm showing you in for post-refractive context, uh, it does improve your prediction and hope this gives you an insight into something which I think is going to become increasingly important, how best to utilize measured post cornea in our formulae. Thank you very much. Thank you, Giacomo, and thank you very much for coming. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm showing you, as Giacomo told you already, the first results of the new ISTAR biometer. And while we're speaking, my, my colleagues are actually measuring patients at the moment to perform the study. So it's a really, really fresh data, which I'm going to show you. My financial disclosures, unless, uh, except for my Huck Streit involvement, are not relevant for this talk. Biometry, the lens star is actually a time domain biometer. We, we never called it uh, an OCT because we, we didn't know it, the imaging qualities of, of the OCT at the time in the, in the mid-90s mid when we started with OCT biometry. So as we have learned from our retinal colleagues that the laser have improved, they, they went from time domain to, um, to, to swept source finally um, with, with higher image quality. We, we realized that uh, in, in our segment, in our anterior segment, OCT, we can use this. We, we used retinal machines, we adapted them, we put optics on top of them, but we haven't adapted it for the biometers. Just only recently, a few companies have adapted into swept source biometry. Um, there are, at the moment, three machines available. Uh, there's another one, a fourth machine, which is not a biometer. They have no axle length, but it's, it's a machine I really like. And there's even now the first publication just recently came out in GSCRS uh, last month comparing two of these new swept source biometers. So it, it has been a couple of years already that the Hark Schreit company has been into developing a swept source OCT biometer. And I'm very proud to present you now the data which we have measured so far. What does this machine do? And it is a, a brand new laser source which is in there, so you have all the advantages of, of imaging the anterior segment, which will help you to find these special cases. You, you'll see the topographies I'll show you later. It, it takes, as, as you would expect, a high resolution picture, so photographies are taken as well. If you have image guided systems, uh, during surgery, we've seen torical IOLs and, and some systems which we are using. So this, it's, it's a platform which can be used for, for these. It, it has a standard keratometry involved as well. So it does SIM case on the OCT, uh, on, on the swept source OCT, as well as measures pure keratometry. And what is the beauty about the machine is really it is absolutely automated for the patient and for, for the user. Um, the graphic user interface is, is really practical and self-explanatory. It's fast and, and hence that's, that's what I think has been also the, the big advantage of the Lenstar and, and finally I hope it will make the iStar machine you, you would like. Um, showing you the images you can see here. Um, that's, that's your anterior segment, so when you, when you measure the patient, you get a, a horizontal and a vertical image straight away um, during measurement as well, and you see actually what's happening. You can look at the images later on. You have the whole anterior cornea, you have the angle, you see the iris, you see the lens. Be aware that even though you see the retina, it's, you won't see a, a macular or fovular depression. So it's, it's really an anterior segment device which measures biometry, axial lengths, but it's not a retinal imaging device. So this, this image is, is not showing you the true image of, of the retina or of the foveola. It's, it's just the, the final step at the end of the retina. Obviously, we, we've taken special cases. Um, you, you see here that's, that's a pseudophagic IOL. You clearly see the, the IOL. Even what surprises me sometimes, we quite get through to the iris, and you can see even behind the iris, the IOL uh, without dilation. Uh, it's not in all cases. I haven't found out yet why we tr we're talking, discussing it with the technicians, but you can quite um, see outside behind the iris sometimes, not in all cases. You have intacts in the cornea, you, you have fakic IOLs um, 
here you, you see vitreous opacities behind it. You see a Fuchs dystrophy, a decompensated cornea here, um, clearly with, with the delin and, and like the decompensation thicker cornea. And, and even here, like uh, DMAG, obviously you can't distinguish, but these eggs you can <coughs> see nicely. So the OCT imaging quality is what you would expect for an anterior OCT imaging device. You, you'll find in this device. As we've heard, we want to measure not only the anterior topography, but also the posterior topographies. And, and obviously, you, you get all this with this device measured by the OCT uh, in, in, in special patterns. Very quick, very fast. Um, it's, it's automated. The patient just sits there. No, nothing is moving in front of the patient. It has two outlets and, and quickly measures, captures actually all the curvature maps you're expecting. I just for this talk, Last week had a, a patient with a corneal ectasia, um, and, and you see here the printout. It's, it's for study only, that's why it has this, this graph over. But you, you, you see this is, this is the eye star, this is the Kaisia, which, which I like and use a lot as well, and this is the, the classical Pentacam. Um, everything the same what you would expect. Um, you can adapt also with drop-down menus the, the topography as, as you would like them and set it out, um, customize it as you would like. Told you it takes an image, it takes pictures, uh, high quality pictures, color pictures, and, and red free, black and white. Uh, it measures white to white, it measures the pupil. Uh, it takes keratometries, true keratometries with, with 16 diodes, and, and that's, that's something it takes within milliseconds. So everything is automated. You don't have to click more than once, and the machine does the rest for both eyes. That's the setup of the actual ongoing study. We have so far recruited 16 eyes. I uh, haven't measured them all. As I said to you, that while we're talking, our, my colleagues are actually measuring the, the patients. So I'm going to show you the first 35 eyes um, just because the rest hasn't been measured yet but recruited. What would you do? We, you see this is our study setup. We, we have dedicated devices. We don't actually use the clinical devices which we use because it's interfering uh, in our patient flow. So we have a, a study room where the patient comes in and actually is being measured three times on each device. It's, it's the, the eye star, the pentacam, the lens star, and the atlas. So the patient rotates around and we actually flip the machinery so it's not always the same uh, a row and, and the measurements are actually random, uh, so you cannot say that there is a bias on, on, on the measurement row, how we go around with the, with the patient measurements. But that's just statistical details. Um, what did we find out? If you compare axial length between the eye star, the new device, the whole length measurement, and the gold standard, also Hawkstride's lens star, it, it shows you here in the blunt uh, plot. It actually is, is almost the same. Clinically, probably not, not a big relevance. Something which is really nice and which is not surprising, it's a much more modern and faster laser, that the repeatability, so if you take your three measurements with both devices and you see how, how close they are together, it doesn't tell you about the accuracy, but it does you tell you about something about the accuracy of the machine, um, that it is three, three times better uh, in, a, in a small range already, but even that it would be a shame if, if we would, would put in a lot of effort and years of um, research if you hadn't had something which is more precise than, than the old machine. Same thing for the ACD, anterior chamber depth, um, compared lens star with the eye star, and again, same, same number in repeatability, uh, the accuracy um, probably won't make it clinically relevant, but the repeatability of this device is, is much higher than of the older one, which is not surprising. It's a time domain laser OCT device. Here you have a swept source. Same thing if you use the, the lens thickness measurements, um, which surprised me. The repeatability is, is six times higher in, in the eyes than the new device than, than the lens star. Um, can't really tell you why it increased so much maybe because of, of, the, of the cataracts. We, we've been measuring mostly cataract patients. The, the average age was uh, 70 years of age. And, and maybe it's, it actually goes better through to ca um, the cataract eyes, uh, something we will have to look into yet. 
On the other side, on, on central corner thickness, um, again, repeatability is, is, is a little bit better on, on the more modern device, on the new device, but not so, so much as, as you would expect or as is expected. Then, if you look at characterometries between the two devices, um, again, repeatability about uh, the same. It's, it's a true characterometry with, with LEDs, um, and, and hence you, you would expect to have the same measurements. If we compare characterometries, and this is a bit of an unfair comparison since it is a true K versus simulated K from, from the Pentacam. So simulated Ks in, in measurement in topographies, anterior topographies, are usually a bit more off than if you use true, true Ks and direct characterometry measurements. And you can see here also in the Bland Altman that the dispersion of, of the measurements are a bit bigger which doesn't tell you which one is the, is the accurate one. It, it could be that the, the Pentacam is the accurate one or the I-Star. I would guess that Pentacam, it takes two seconds to actually measure, scan the, the eye. Um, this is done much, much faster and, and probably with, with the higher repeatability, it, it would, I would err to say this is the, the higher accuracy as well in, in the I-Star. Same thing here, if you measure with a Placido, um, device, the, the Atlas, then, then you'll see there's the same scatter. It's a bit, little, little bit less than, than actually in the Pentacam, and the repeatability um, is, is much, much higher in, in the ISTAR compared to the Atlas. If you look at corneal, uh, posterior corneal curvatures, um, it's, it's actually quite similar between the Pentacam and the ISTAR. Uh, here we make a true comparison because it's not a, an LED true characterometry based measurement, but it's a mean posterior um, sim PK uh, in both devices, and, and you actually get almost the same results, but still a little bit higher of the, the repeatability. So in device testing, retesting is, is higher for the ISTAR than the Pentacam. To conclude, it's, it's a new device, it's, it's really highly accurate, uh, the repeatability is, is absolutely perfect. It, it compares clinically really, really well with, with the gold standards uh, which, which are out there. What is not surprising, uh, you would expect Swiss precision in, in such a device. But what I really, really like, and I've been discussing with my colleagues already here, is, is that the, the graphic user interface, the practicability, if you put the patient in front of it, you start, you click once, it goes through, you get a result um, which, which you can look at immediately. Um, that's, that's really the nice thing about this machine. So to show you, this is the, the core team. Um, not, not all of them, they at, at Hark Stride Lab, you see all these, these devices here. Um, we've been working together for, for many, many years and my, our two colleagues, the study nurses, while we're talking, are still measuring patients at this moment. No, not Saturday, but yesterday and, and the week after. And I thank you for your attention. Pleasure to be here. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'll go through uh, how we uh, went through our transition to the Hill RBF and where we stand today and some of our uh, patient database which we've studied with the Hill RBF. Uh, these are my financial disclosures. So two major things that changed our character practice in the last decade and uh, uh, both of them are related to what Hawkstrike does. So 10 years back, uh, we were doing more and more premium IOLs and uh, we were using the immersion ultrasonic biometry with the autokeratometers. And we would get about 85% patients within uh, one diopter of emetropia, uh, just about 50% uh, within the plus minus 0.5. And you can see how things have changed over the years. Now we talk about the 90%. So our percentage of premium miles, uh, because we were probably not doing optical biometry at that time, torix were just 2 to 3%, and multifocals were maybe just 3 to 4%. Uh, most of the times, we were not confident of uh, getting uh, uh, accurate results. And uh, that probably translated to this lack of confidence. So optical biometry had been around for about five, six years when we uh, started thinking of doing that. But colleagues who were using biometers were not doing it routinely for every patient. And uh, those devices at that time were probably not getting in through, especially in Indian cataracts where we have more opaque cataracts. Uh, more often we have the intumescent and the advanced cataracts. We were probably not getting that many measurements. And uh, 
they were using it selectively for their patients with premium myoles probably and still most relied on ultrasonic uh, immersion biometry. So somewhere in 2011, um, I had been wanting to get uh, optical biometer for many years and uh, you know, listening to Dr. Hill and comparing to several other biometers available at the time, we went with the uh, LensStar. We wanted to improve our results with toric IOLs and the multifocal IOLs. Uh, we got the LensStar. Early days were good. We started measuring all eyes, irrespective of those with mature cataracts. We managed to get through almost about 80% or more at that time. Today we do much more. And uh, for the opaque cataracts, we would use the ultrasonic uh, AXL length from the immersion scans and still get other measurements from the lens star. So it still improved our accuracy in a big way, which we continue to do today as well for some of those small percentage of advanced cataracts. And uh, in six months, I think our results were dramatically better. Over 80% patients were within a half diopter of uh, emetropia. Our toric numbers kept increasing, and we were doing many more multifocals. So this all can be attributed probably to the optical biometry, which is probably the first change that we saw. And uh, I stopped doing biometry myself, which I used to be very meticulously doing till we got the lens star. Uh, now we could have three good technicians and good repeatability. Opaque cataracts, uh, we improved quite a bit as well because all our other measurements were more accurate, as I mentioned. And uh, for patients with astigmatism, I think, again, a big jump. Leinster keratometries were, uh, even today, I find are so good uh, that we are very, very good with our toric results. And we were, of course, using four or five different devices, but uh, the Leinster remained the mainstay. We also did the virions uh, and the other measurements. So the toric planner, I think we have to thank uh, Dr. Barrett for that. The Barrett's toric calculator is fantastic. And on the Leinster, this thing is so user-friendly uh, to use the toric calculator uh, that we, the toric pan planner is amazing. And uh, I think Barrett's toric calculator was a huge step forward on the Leinster when we got it. And now, of course, it's available online and almost on all other devices as well. So you don't need to use the various company calculators anymore. And uh, in 2014, thanks to uh, Warren considering me for the beta testing site for the Hill RBF calculator, we started working with the Excel sheets. And uh, initially, we would get on the on, uh, only on the Excel sheets, and then it came online. And we would use the uh, LensStar for our measurements, and then go online and uh, do the provide the data for the RBF. This is how it looked before we started using the RBF. There would be three, four different formulas. And even the Barrett's was not available at that time on the Leinster. And then uh, with the RBF, we started noticing that uh, it would match the SRKT and Barrett's in most cases. It was very much more reliable in the long eyes. And we started studying patients with disparity between the formulas more closely. And most often, our results would show that Hill RBF and Barrett's would come out as very, very accurate and pretty consistent. And uh, so, of course, the online RBF calculator was nice, and the out-of-bounds function was very helpful. And uh, today, it continues to help us. Uh, in somewhere in 16, 17, the Hill RBF got integrated into the LensStar, which again was a big convenience because till then we would just sit online and keep working on that. Now the staff found it so easy to just get the Hill RBF out, and we stopped using most of the other formulas except the RBF and the Barrett's universal. And uh, this would give us uh, special printouts and. Now, somewhere last year, the Hill RBF2, this is what we've uh, studied with for our, most of our uh, patients recently. I think the Hill RBF2 has uh, really increased the database, uh, which has made it so much more robust and well-tested. It dramatically increases the range of patients that you can measure uh, for calculate from uh, 40 diopters to a minus 5, uh, from an axial length of about 17 or 18 mm to uh, 35, I think. And uh, we have now 12,400 plus eyes in the database. And especially for almost 1,000 eyes with the short axial length, which makes it really robust uh, for the short eyes. And uh, there are much fewer out of bounds eyes now as compared to what we were using before. This makes it very, very uh, useful as well. And uh, it's now possible to aim for uh, different residual refractive errors than a zero or the emetropia. So you can plan a small uh, change in refractive error if you're looking for one. So the, also it got integrated with the Abulafia Koch Tori calculator on the machine. The Leinster got an upgrade on the software as well. It started showing us these uh, warnings, uh, which really helps us because it quickly stands out. So this makes it very much easy for the assistants. And also, if you see the printout, you can quickly see if there are any potential errors. So you can be more careful. 
And for our, uh, especially for our astigmatism patients, I think this calculator was uh, very useful. We do by default for all patients, even with 0.5 cylinders, we do the toric calculation across the board. We use, just like Dr. Barrett said, most of their, uh, his cases are toric. We have a big jump in our toric numbers. And uh, now the most uh, useful thing which I would like to highlight today is probably this feature of the Hale RBF, uh, which you know stands out for this uh, way of measuring IOLs, is the out of bounds feature. It quickly tells you if your measurements and your calculation is in bounds, and it would tell you if some of the parameters are beyond the range of the Hale RBF, which are very few now, but it stands out because it immediately tells you it's out of bounds. Now, I don't think any other formula really does this. Uh, it tells you when the formula is not to be used, when it's not going to be accurate, and these are usually those eyes where you'll get a refractive surprise, as I'll just show you. We have unpublished data, which is likely to be in publication soon, of 250 eyes, a single surgeon using the Technus 1 lens, and uh, this range of axial length and keratometries and astigmatism less than one. We were using the lens star. We have about uh, 21 eyes in the short axial length group, 153 eyes in the uh, 22 to 25 millimeters, and the uh, more than 25 is at 76, so about 250 eyes. Now, we had patients where there was no acceptance, which means they were less than a 0.25. Um, just 37.6 in the short eyes uh, percentage and 48.3% in the 22 to 25 group and 46 here. Now, if you look at the plus minus half, uh, we have about 83% in the short eyes, about 90% in the eyes which are 22 to 25 and 85.7 here. And now plus one, plus minus one is about 95 for the short eyes, 99 for the 22 to 25. These are pretty consistent with uh, what we would see with uh, the other good formulas today. So this was uh, probably our data, which is slightly different from what some of the other uh, studies have shown. So for the shorter eyes, we have refractive surprises over one day after in about 4.7 percent eyes, uh, just about 1.1 percent in the 22 to 25, and in the more than 25 group, the longer eyes, 2.3. Now this, I think, pretty much ma ma matches up to what we see with the Barrett's calculator today. But we did notice that for the shorter eyes, uh, probably a small, maybe it was not statistically significant, but the Hill RBF stood out as maybe getting slightly better readings than the Barrett's, whereas in the longer eyes, the Barrett's was much better. They seem to be pretty similar in the, uh, in the eyes from the 22 to the 25. Now, I think uh, we then had about 11 eyes during the time of the study which were out of bounds and were not included in the study. So we went out and studied those eyes which came in the out of bounds group. And there, the Barrett's or the SRKT was used for the IL selection. We had about eight eyes, which is about 72% came up within the plus minus half. And we had nine eyes within the plus minus one. So we had two eyes which had a refractive surprise, which is quite significant. So what, I, uh, what we understand is that if a eye is marked as out of bounds by the Hill RBF, I think it's really important to go back and work harder on the calculations and make sure that you're accurate because these are the eyes where you're likely to get a surprise even with the other formulas. And I think it's a very big feature that, uh, you know, probably we don't pay attention to as much as we should. And uh, so for us, uh, to conclude how uh, it changed our practice, uh, almost 90% patients are now uh, plus minus half, which is probably the standard of care today. I think out of bounds uh, for us is very useful, as I already mentioned, to identify the potential surprises. We are doing more torics and multifocals than ever before, partly because better, better lenses are available, better understanding, uh, better uh, toric calculators with the posterior corneal astigmatism, as uh, Dr. Barrett has helped us come through with. We now have about 34% of our practice is torics, and about 27% is multifocals and growing. Uh, I think our staff has much more confidence when they counsel patients for premium IOLs. And uh, we get more referrals for now high refractive errors from practices where they don't have uh, options of optical biometry or using the modern formulas. We still have in India uh, penetration of optical biometry is not as good as it is maybe in the West. So I think uh, it has really helped us uh, change our practice and uh, put together the optical biometry, the Hill RBF, the Barrett's all have contributed for us to get better and better results. And I think uh, we should be looking more closely at those out of bound size. Thank you. All right, so I was asked to bring, uh, this is a presentation we, we presented last year 
And this, uh, it was supposed to be focused on the RBF formula by Warren Hill, but it was just a comparison of, of new formulas. I think it's very exciting for those who have been involved in, in IL power calculations and biometry for many years to see the improvements uh, that has, have been achieved the last five to 10 years with uh, the new formulas that uh, we are using, uh, not just the ones that have been cited. This year we've got two new ones that I think have a good future, which are the EBO and the Kane formula that are showing very good results in the in the first uh, presentations. And the new devices like the iStar that we saw this morning here uh, that are taking us to the limit of what can be measured with precision and accuracy. So it's expected that in the near future, all these uh, a slide will change and just a very few of them will remain there. But up to now, we've been calculating uh, IL power by means of historically thin lens versions formulas, uh, some thick lens models with uh, ray tracing like Olson's and Oculix showed up uh, several years ago. Um, we've got also a statistics, and I have to mention, of course, first the regression by S SRK 1 and 2. Uh, the introductor of um, can, be, can be called big data analysis was uh, Gerald Clark with the Monte Carlo method and finally Warren Hill with his RBF uh, formula. And why not? We've got also the intra-op refraction uh, option which is rendering quite good results. From all of this, my personal uh, feeling and, um, has been always uh, for optics because I, I've been uh, interested in optics for many years, and I want a method not just to be accurate, but robust. And optics work, we know that, as long as the model is correctly defined. And if you work with uh, exact optics, you can uh, build a telescope, you can build a microscope, or of course you can calculate an IOL. But statistics came, and uh, well, this was the slide. You see the pros and cons of these Bergen's formulas. And the ray tracing has the main advantage of being a thick lens model, which has allowed these years to take account of the posterior surface of the cornea. And as I was saying, I was a bit skeptical about the statistics in a way that I know that for 99% of eyes, it works not just with a big data method, any polynomial regression will make a good job as long as you feed it with reliable and high quality data. Um, but what worries me is that 1% of cases that is not correctly represented in the original database and therefore will not produce even a meaningful or, uh, a result with this method. So this has been my evolution. I haven't used the, the RBF method uh, ever, practically, in the clinic. But I was pushed to, to try it, as many papers have shown that uh, Hill's method uh, is producing good results. So this, this is a plot where we can see what we are getting now with the newest formulas, especially those that I considered the best the last years, which are the Barrett, Universal 2, and the Olsen, uh, built in the FACO Optics software, that are the, the ones that, that, that I use. And we are getting normally something around 80, 85, 90% of cases in plus minus 0.5, and nearly 99% of my, plus minus 1. This is numbers that you can get regularly and that you see once again. In big samples, analyzed retrospectively, like this one, normally numbers drop down a little bit. In this present study, we analyzed 100 eyes. Uh, it was one eye per patient. And we did three groups for short, uh, long, and, and uh, normal range. Um, refractive prediction error was calculated after the IL constant was optimized. And I have to say that for Heige's formula, only one constant was then. So this is a fail because, of course, this, this will take Heige's to underscore against if it's uh, the tri triple optimization is done. 
and uh, I is defined as out of bounds by, by RBF were excluded from the analysis. So these were the demographics. You can see we oversampled the long and short eyes. So we've got 30 eyes in the long group and, and we've got uh, uh, 35 in the short group. And the long guys, if you go to the maximum, they are not very, very long guys. This, of course, depends on the lens that was being analyzed. It has a limit in its production. So this is the refraction prediction error for all eyes. And you can see that if you go to the standard deviation, that that will give you the spread and therefore the precision of the formula, the Barrett and the Hill formulas were equal. So they were getting a 0.32 and the other formulas were, were doing worse. So if I, if I confess you, this was a surprise to me because, because I was not expecting the heel to perform as well, but it did. Uh, there was one outlier there that I think it was probably a measurement error because normally we don't see such an error. Sometimes it can occur. So this was the absolute refraction prediction error and you can go, for example, as a parameter to the median absolute uh, prediction error, and you see that here the Barrett was number one, but here was very close to it, just 0.19 diopters, so it's a pretty good result. This is the graphic showing the plus minus 0.5 and plus minus one, and you can see them both Barrett and Hill were, were achieving an 87% of ice that range, while the other formulas were doing quite worse. So if you're thinking about premium IOLs, especially if you're thinking about multifocals, where emetropia is a must, it's clear which is the way to go. So this is, this is comparing to the results published, for example, by Mel's and his group, and David Cook's group, so we can see that it's quite uh, homogeneous, and we are repeating uh, these results once and once again. So it's been published again with other, uh, by other authors. So I think it's, it can be said it's proved. In the short eyes, you can see the predictions. You can go to the standard deviations. Here is a, a big surprise with the holiday one that for one reason or the other got a, a, a strangely good result in terms of the standard deviation of the prediction error. Here, Warren Hills was a little better than Barrett's. And again, I tell you this is a surprise to me because the main fail from a theoretical point of view of Barrett's is that it doesn't take account of the lens thickness. So it's only taking account of the ACD. So it's clear that in some eyes, it will not predict correctly the anterior segment dimension. And in short eyes, this is critical because a very small error in the ELP prediction will render a higher refractive error than in normal or in long eyes due to the high power of the IOL. So if you move the same amount of high power IOL, the change in effective power will be higher. It's obvious. So my expectative was that in short eyes, Hill was going to be quite worse, well, I don't know if quite worse, but worse at least than, for example, Barrett's formula, that it's taking account of the ACD and the LT. So to my surprise in this case, but I have to say these are 35 eyes, and in such small samples, a couple of outliers uh, change completely the, the, the image, so take account of that. So I think we need really uh, higher samples to confirm which formula performs best in short eyes. So this goes to the absolute, uh, prediction error, and this is the plus minus 0.5, plus minus 1, that in short eyes was really good. Heigis did worse, and I say again, this is probably a methodological fail because we only optimized one constant. In middle eyes, here again Barrett overperformed the other, but Hill was quite close to it. So it's clear that once and once again, through all the groups, both formulas are doing very well. So you can trust them and you can use them at the same time to check your prediction. And the nice thing of that is that one is playing from the theoretical optics side 
and the other is playing the game from the statistical side. So I think it's, it's quite a nice thing to, to check the predictions with two completely different approaches so that you are more uh, confident on your final selection of the IOL. So this was that. And this is the absolute prediction error. And here we have again. And here we are again in that 80 a lot percent of ice. Sorry, 80 a lot percent of ice in plus minus uh, 0.5. See the Barrett nearly in the 90 percent. In long ice, here Hill was a little better. You, you heard in the presentation before that was just the opposite, but I tell you again, with 30, 40, 50 uh, N samples, things can change just with a couple of, of uh, differences. So he, these were the numbers, which I can tell that for long guys are very good. I have to say that these were not, uh, there was no optimization of the axial length following one cock or whatever. And this was again the plus minus 0.5, here a little worse, and the plus minus one. So this is the final slide where we can see uh, the performance of these uh, formulas in the long group, in the middle and the short, and it's clear that the Barrett and the Hill were doing the best job. Probably uh, Dr. Barrett's formula was doing a little better, so it's my opinion. I think it's more trustable, and the good thing of that is that there will be no surprises uh, whenever that anterior segment is not correctly represented, but uh, the Hill RBF formula is showing a consistent uh, good uh, predictive power, and it's giving you again results, uh, I think that at what we call the standard right now. And I thank you very much for your attention.